Hi everyone, Stepan here. It's Thursday, so welcome to another Thursday Endgame video. Uh, this week we are going to start Opposite Colored Bishop Endgames. And this is going to be a series of three videos, maybe even four. And this first one is going to be the introductory video, part one, where we go over the basics of uh, Opposite Colored Bishop Endgames and where we go over uh, the easy to draw let's say, opposite color bishop endgames. And then in the other videos, we are going to continue with the more complicated stuff. Okay, first, before we get into the basics and the simple positions such as this one you see on the board, I would just like to give you a couple of rules. Uh, one pawn, usually a draw. Two pawns, very complicated. Three pawns, usually winning. But there are ex exceptions to all three. And the second rule you can follow is the farther away the pawns are from each other, if the winning or the attacking side has multiple pawns, it will be easier to win. So if they are uh, far away from each other, the attacking side will have an easier time winning. Also, if the pawns are connected, defending each other, then different rules apply. Okay, now let's let's get on into the basics. Um, generalizations in opposite colored bishop endgames from my experience are not good and very often these positions can be exact. I have however managed to uh, write down general rules which would help me uh, play exact positions better. So I'm going to try to share that with you. Okay, let's start with the easiest uh, examples. One pawn for the attacker is a draw if you can capture the pawn with your bishop. It's as simple as that. Now I wrote here on the screen that your bishop should control the queening square. That's just the easiest uh, thing to do. Just put your bishop on a diagonal on a diagonal where it controls the queening square and eventually it's going to be a draw. Of course you can stop the pawn uh, before it reaches the sixth rank or sixth rank or whatever if you can. This position is obviously just a draw because at some point white is going to have to advance his pawn to d8 at, at which point the bishop is going to take and it's going to be a draw because it's uh, impossible to checkmate with the bishop. I'm going to show you just one example of where that wouldn't work because black has already messed up. Of course in this position uh, if we hypothetically imagine the position a few moves ago black probably could have saved it now it's too late. Uh, with black to move uh, the position is an easy draw because black would play bishop to e6. That would be the only drawing move. Uh, and with white to move, the position is an easy win because black plays the move e7 and now there is no more way to, to stop the pawn. Uh, if the king was for some reason on c8 uh, for, for white, then the position would still be a draw because after d7, black could play bishop e6 using the pin uh, on the king. Okay, so even one pawn can be lost if you are not careful, so try not to take these endgames for granted, even though they are drawn 99% of the time, be precise, occupy the diagonal that controls the queening square, and that's it. Now, uh, a bit more harder stuff. Uh, with doubled pawns, don't assume that they are very similar to having one pawn. Same as in, in rook end games. Sometimes uh, in, in rook end games, the doubled pawns can provide crucial tempi, even though, let's say, the defending side uh, manages to get the opposition. In bishop end games, one of the pawns or the frontal pawn is going to be used as cannon fodder, just sacrificing itself for the bishop, and then the other pawn is going to promote. Unless you are able to control the queening square with your king and with your bishop. Therefore, the, the frontal pawn will not be able to sacrifice itself. In this case, the position is simply won for white because white is going to advance his, let's say he plays this, I don't know, move the, move the bishop. Eventually, he's going to advance his pawn to d8. The bishop is going to have to capture and then the other pawn is simply going to queen. So doubled pawns are winning more often than not. And very often they will be winning more so than pawns on different files. So remember that that at least visually, if if it this if this looks simple, remember that it's really not. And you have to put your king in front of the pawns, controlling the queening square along with your bishop. Okay. Now in part two uh, of this series, we are going to be dealing with separate pawns. Uh, today we are just going to uh, brush up on the matter. But basically the hard part about, uh, about opposite colored bishop endgames are pawns that are one, two or three files apart. 
if we are talking about two pawns. Uh, that we are going to do next time. And there, there are not so many general rules you could follow and the positions are much more complex. Today I wanted to go over connected pawns because that's easier. And once you get that over with, then, then it's going to be just much easier to understand these endgames. And you can basically say you, you understand 50% of, of opposite colored bishop endgames. Okay, we will divide positions with connected pawns uh, two ways. One way is going to be have the pawns reached the sixth rank, or are they on the fifth, fourth, third, second rank, whatever, and are the pawns on central files or including the rook file? Because if the pawns include the rook file, so rook file, knight file, so a, b, uh, or g, h, then the position is usually a draw unless black has a horribly bad position and the king is nowhere or the, or, yeah. Okay, so sixth rank or below and rook file, including the rook file or not. Okay, now uh, connected pawns on the sixth rank are winning no matter where the defender's uh, king is and where the defender's bishop is. There are no perfect positions unless the pawns include the rook file. So this position is simply one. Okay, what we don't want to do, and this is a general rule you can remember, this is a rule which I've seen broken in tournament games, uh, is you don't want to move your pawns. You never move your pawns. In this exact position, if you play the move d7, I hope you can see it, bishop d7, cd7, king d7, draw. If you play the move c7, which may be harder to see, then simply king d7 and the draw, because there is no way to make progress. The hard part about opposite color bishop endgames is that you don't have a piece that can challenge your opponent's piece. In this case, uh, black is controlling the light squares. You have no way of challenging the light squares. So advancing your pawn to c7 in this case would be a clear draw. The way to win is... First, you want to restrict your opponent's king. Secondly, you want to improve your own, your own king. Obviously, your pawns are at no risk of being captured. Only if you move away too far from your c6 pawn, in this case, the black bishop may be able to attack it with bishop f3 and force the pawn forward, and then black would play king d7. So, logic states that you will want to improve your king this way while defending the c6 pawn. Uh, the, the easiest way to start is just to, same as when trying to checkmate with the two bishops or with bishop at knight and knight, just try to restrict the opponent's king as much as possible. So in this case, the king is not going to d8, and that means that it's never going to c8. So black has to wait. So let's say bishop c8. And now you simply advance your king. We want to be able to advance our king forward whenever we can. It, there's, it, there's nothing black can do about it. So let's say bishop to e6, king to b6, let's say king to d8, since we blocked the diagonal, king to b7 check, king to e8, king to c7, and here he can resign because we basically advance our pawn uh, and, and promote one of the pawns. Now the bishop can sacrifice itself. Okay, so this is fairly easily winning as long as we remember that we want to keep our pawns put, we don't advance our pawns, we limit the mobility of the defender's king, and then we improve our own king. Okay, one more example. Uh, even if the black pieces are placed sort of ideally, what we are going to see, I, I'm sorry, I should have talked about the, the pawns on the fifth rank first. I wanted to give you this position just to illustrate uh, that black here has managed to get his perfect setup. What you can see on the right side of the screen is the setup for drawing against less advanced pawns. And you want the bishop on this diagonal. What does that mean? That means that if the king should move away from the c6 pawn, we take it. And if the d7 pawn, if the d pawn should advance to d7, we, we, we capture it. But when the pawns are on the sixth rank, that simply doesn't work. Okay, so for example, uh, bishop to g5 check. The king goes to c8, and then we can simply lose the tempo with, with bishop to e7, and the black king doesn't have anywhere to go. So it's it's just, if, if the king goes to c8, then we simply advance. We play uh, pawn, to, pawn to d7, and we promote because the bishop is defending d8. And if the bishop moves to f7, we, we still advance, and, and that's it. So on the sixth rank, it's very hard to go for the defensive setup that we that we want to go for when the pawns are, are less advanced. Okay, now let's have a look at uh, pawns on the sixth rank. 
when they include the rook file. As I said, this is a draw and I've actually seen someone resign, not in a tournament game, but in a blitz game in my club two years ago. We were playing a blitz tournament and this position was on the board. He resigned. I said, be yeah, out. That's lost eventually. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a draw. I, I'm not sure about the exact positioning of the bishop, bishops, but it was a draw as one international master explained after the game. So in this position, uh, of course, the black king doesn't run away to the corner. That would spell disaster. Uh, the king goes to c8. And in this position, whatever you do, it's a draw. So black only has to wait with his bishop. His king is ideally placed. We said if the pawn advances to a7, then the bishop is controlling the entire diagonal. And this is a mistake that you need to bounce, bounce on at immediately as soon as your opponent plays something like this, advances the pawn so that you can blockade both pawns with your bishop. That, that's it. So a7 in this case would mean that it's just a draw. The bishop could go a8, b7, a8, b7, draw. If the other pawn advances, so pawn to b7, then of course we capture the pawn uh, twice and it's a draw because the bishop alone cannot check me. So white has to do something other than moving the pawns. There is no improvement with the bishop. If the bishop moves away from this diagonal, the king could simply go back to b8, uh, or it doesn't. Uh, if the bishop stays on this diagonal, then black simply moves the bishop around. So let's say bishop g2, king d6, bishop a8, king c5, bishop g2. And eventually, I mean, your king could get here, that doesn't mean anything. Eventually, you're going to have to push one of the pawns and then it's going to be a draw. So remember this. If your opponent has uh, two pawns and one of them is on the H file or the A file and they are connected, what you want to do is, of course, get your king in front of the pawns. Uh, of course, this can be won if, if the black king was on A8. Then there's no question about that. But if you can, before the pawns advance too far, then get your king in front, get your bishop on the diagonal, controlling the corner, queening square, and then this setup simply works. There is no way to, to make progress. All right. Now, let's look at the most complicated position uh, for today. We're going to look at this position with the defender's bishop placed perfectly and with the uh, defender's bishop placed badly, placed in a way that simply loses the game. If you want, pause the video here and play uh, for white. It's basically white to play and when this position is winning. Okay, as we said, as, as you can see on the right part of, of the on the screen, uh, connected pawns on the fifth rank or farther away from promotion, so meaning fourth, third, second rank, are drawn if you are able to set up a defensive position in which your bishop is attacking one of the pawns and stopping the other pawn from promoting. So in this case, where do you want your bishop? You would like to have your bishop, for example, on g8, because then if e6 is played, you take it. And if the king moves away from d5, then, then you take the d5 pawn. And again, there is no, there would be no way to make progress. In this position, since the bishop is not controlling the e6 square, and since we have a dark squared bishop, which black cannot oppose, we simply advance e6. The black king is basically forced either to, uh, to e8 or to d6, and once it gets to d6, we play bishop f4 check, removing the blockade, king e7, and now king e5. There is no way for black to challenge us on the light squares, there is no way for black to win the e6 pawn, and we are simply after, for example, king e8 going to advance and, and going to win. Okay, now let's look at this position. Uh, I, I switched the bishops, so it doesn't really matter. If the pawns are on the fifth rank, uh, then the defender must go for this defensive setup. A. King in front of the pawns. If your king is behind the pawns anywhere, the defender's king, then the position is just lost. No way to defend. Second thing, the bishop needs to be attacking one pawn and stopping the other from moving. So if you had a light squared bishop, or if black had a light squared bishop, you need the bishop on f7 or on g8. Since you have a dark squared bishop, the bishop has to be on c7 or on b8. Why? So that when the pawns advance, you can take you can take one of them. So if d6, you take it. Sorry. Uh, if e6, then you play bishop d6 or king d6, and it's going to be a draw. And if the king moves away from the e5 pawn, then you take the e5 pawn. And no way for white to make progress. A terrible blunder. For example, for white would be d6, where you just take it. If you, for example, play uh, bishop to g4, 
trying to wait, then simply bishop c7. If you go king e4, then we go bishop b8. If you go, I don't know, king f5, then we go bishop c7, and, and that's it. Okay. And for example, if king c5 just moving away, then bishop e5. So this is something that you have to remember. And this is the most important thing you should take from this video, I think. When the pawns are on the fifth rank or less advanced, the defending setup is king in front of the pawns, bishop controlling uh, the square where one of the pawns wants to advance and attacking the other pawn. So I, I hope this makes sense. You're attacking e5, you're stopping d6. If you had a light squared bishop, you will be attacking d5 and stopping e6. Remember that and you should be able to draw this. Now, of course, the farther away the pawns are from pr promotion, so if the pawns were on d2 and e2, it would be much easier to set up this position. As we saw in the last example, which is a position I set up, but it doesn't matter. Uh, let's assume that black is a grandmaster. It's still impossible to create the defensive setup because your pieces are just placed badly. Were the pawns on d2 and e2, black would have no issue drawing this because he would have enough time to set up his bishop perfectly. Okay, we will uh, continue next week uh, with separated pawns, starting with pawns separated uh, one file. As I said, uh, the, the less separated pawns, separate pawns are, it's going to be easier to draw, or the more separate the pawns are in general, the higher the winning chances. Uh, and yeah, we're going to work on that next week. Now, next week's video is going to be hard. So if you want, uh, prepare for that video by uh, analyzing some opposite color bishop endgames, just to get a general idea of what problems you will have during the game. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, see you next Thursday with another endgame video and stay tuned for more chess. Bye-bye.